USA Today using the Hey, how you doing? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books and marketing expert covering Ivy League colleges patent. Hey, how you doing? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books and marketing expert covering Ivy League colleges panic, restore SAT testing as woke students fail. Let's get into the story. Before we do, please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate you guys. Coming from the college fix, Ivy League changes mind, SATs no longer racist. And coming from USA Today, using the SAT, ACT in college admissions isn't racist. What else has the... Yeah, man. I told you the tide is turning, man. The tide is turning. Shout out to Nate Ways, man. My man. Nate Ways, man. Off Nation Hall of Fame, a.k.a. Ricky Henderson. Getting the ball rolling, man. Shout out to Nate Ways, man. Using the SAT, ACT, and college admissions isn't racist. They're starting, the tide is starting to turn, man. Many colleges got rid of that, man. Many colleges got rid of that in the wake of George Floyd. They said it was racist. But now they're starting to reinstate it. What says the left got wrong? After ditching standardized testing, in part by arguing they advance systemic race inequity, a parade of top universities recently announced they are reinstating the SAT requirement. Three Ivy League schools, Yale, Brown, and Dartmouth, all made the announcement in recent weeks. The University of Texas at Austin joined this month, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology has already reinstated it in 2022. After research and study, university leaders state they have found that a student's future academic success can be measured most accurately with the presence of standardized tests such as the SAT and ACT entrance exams. Because you have to have a way of uniformly identifying who is appropriate for each of the institutions. And you do have to compare students against other students. Yes, there are special situations and there are special cases, but 90% of it is is this person going to succeed in our environment or are they not? Because if they're not, it's terrible for the school and it's terrible for the student, even with inflating grades. And unfortunately for diversity, equity, and inclusion, they do inflate grades based on skin color in many colleges. Major lawsuit over this from the college fix, nearly 400 Penn State faculty protest white professors lawsuit against race-based grading. Race-based grading. So they give, they give, they give different grades based on your race. So I guess a white person, if a white person gets an 80 on a test, it's 80. If a black person gets an 80 on the test, that's like a 95, man. If an Asian person gets an 80 on the test, that's like a 60. Wow. I had no idea they were doing this, man. I promise you I had no idea they were doing this. The protest white professors lawsuit against race-based grading. Nearly 400 Pennsylvania State University professors have signed a letter that defends anti-racism teaching and administrative practices targeted in a lawsuit objecting to giving black students inflated grades. Inflated grades are not good for the student. They're not good for the institution. Of course, it's not fair to other students whose grades aren't being inflated. But at some point, People have to succeed in society. They've got to be able to be competitive. And of course, that starts with standardized testing before you even get accepted into an institution. And they say here, quote, after a few years of being test optional, colleges have discovered that GPA alone is inadequate to predict college success. Jeremy Wayne Tate told the college fix in an email, grading varies widely between different schools, whereas a standardized test allows colleges to compare apples to apples. Not that human beings are apples, but come on, we need some metaphors to be able to understand what's going on here. Tate is the founder of the Classic Learning Test, a classically liberal alternative to the SAT and ACT, a relatively new standardized test now accepted by more than 200 institutions. 
USA opinion columnist Ingrid Jacques told The Fix, just because something sounds good or equitable doesn't mean it is. Jacques wrote a column last month headline, using the SAT in college admissions isn't racist, what else has the left got wrong? We've been told for years that standardized tests like the ones used traditionally for college entrance exams are racist, inequitable, and unfair, she wrote, but perhaps not. Standardized tests have always been a solid predictor of student success when combined with other factors, and they offer a consistent measuring device of student preparation, regardless of where they're from. Dartmouth, when it announced in February its decision, had stated the standardized tests actually help with diversity. Quote, contrary to what some have perceived, standardized testing allows us to admit a broader and more diverse range of students, the college stated in a news release. Contextually strong testing clearly enhances the admission chances of high achieving applicants from less resource backgrounds when such scores are disclosed. Brown University also announced in a news release similar sentiments, noting data suggested unintended adverse outcomes of test optional policies in the admissions process itself, potentially undermining the goal of increasing access. Yale echoed similar sentiments. Yale's research from before and after the pandemic has consistently demonstrated among all application components, test scores are the single greatest predictor of a student's future Yale grades when used thoughtfully as part of a whole person review process. Yeah, so they're bringing back, they're bringing back testing. Thank God, man. Son's going to be mad, 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 mad. Mad, mad, mad. Um, we don't like tests, man. When I look back, he's behind me chasing me. Surveillance video shows what she's talking about. You can see a 48-year-old woman running for her life with a complete stranger on her tail. She spoke with Pix11 News by phone. And I see him behind me running. That's on so video. I run because I'm like, if I don't make it inside where the guard is supposed to be, I'm done. It all started when she got on a northbound J train at the Cypress Hill station in Brooklyn. She was headed to Jamaica, Queens to work. It was early morning two weeks ago. Once on the train, she says this man immediately made her feel uncomfortable. He came and he sat right next to me. And I found it weird because it was empty. There was a whole bunch of seats. Why are you going to sit right next to me? And then the minute he sat next to me, he started like looking at me. I could feel that he just he was just looking at me. He was too close. So she says she got up and moved to another car, but and I went to the next car. And when I look back, he's right behind me. So I told him, "Why are you following me? What do you want?" The man apparently did not respond. So I spoke to him in Spanish, and then he said something about, "Oh, you look cute. You smell good." And I said, "Just keep walking. And leave me alone." The entire ride, she tried to ignore him, not making eye contact. But once she got off the train... When I went upstairs, he was standing by the door waiting for me. She says she did not see any police officers or MTA employees to ask them for help. So she just kept moving, walking faster and faster until this happened. The man chased her into her workplace, grabbed her, and that's not all. And he started punching me, hitting me, and I started defending myself. I started bleeding from my hand. A security guard was able to help her, but the man got away, leaving her in bad shape physically. And he... That's a hole on Brito, man. Emotionally. I'm terrified. I can't sleep. I had a nightmare. I fear for, you know, a lot of other women in the train because he's still out there. Wow. So it's, it's still happening, man. Um, it's still happening. More attacks. We're in East Harlem where this continues to be a delicate dance in addressing this passionate debate about how to protect someone's rights when they're experiencing a severe mental health crisis 
and of course protecting the public safety. I'm petrified. I'm sick of it. Lisa, a native New Yorker from the Bronx, offering her opinion on the state of affairs in the subway system, specifically her train stop on East 125th Street in East Harlem, where earlier this week, a 45-year-old man was fatally pushed onto the tracks. The suspect, a 24-year-old man who relatives say has at least two mental health hospitalizations. Lisa and other riders we met Friday fed up with what they say is a revolving door of psychiatric care. What do you worry about when you're standing on the platform? I worry about being pushed. They should be in a mental institution. You can't be just have them on the street, you know, and then after something happened, then they talk about it. The challenge, figuring out the most effective way to engage with someone in mental health crisis, how long they should remain in treatment, and whether that should be done against their will. We're going to respect civil liberties, but you don't respect individuals when you ignore that they're crying out for help. On Thursday, Mayor Eric Adams touted the latest efforts to prevent another tragedy, including $20 million in Governor Kathy Hochul's proposed budget to expand from 2 to 10 the number of scout or mental health co-response teams. Scout teams have the authority to hospitalize someone in crisis against their will. Governor Hochul is also proposing the addition of 200 new inpatient psychiatric beds. In uh, yeah, this is this starting to wake up, man. You got to address these people that use the subway as like that live uh, that live in these subways. DC, we have a nice subway, very nice subway. Historically, it's getting a little run down, but historically it's, it was the best in north america and we got a lot of people that you know they basically just live on the train or live in the tunnels on the underground stations and stuff as long as they can they stay down there as long as they can but new york's different new york has a whole city underground new york has a whole city an entire city underneath it. It's two cities. It's the city on the street and it's the city underground. And it's the city in the sky because they got all those skyscrapers. But yeah, you got to address this, man. And you can't worry about race, man. Fuck racism. The crazy people you encounter and have to hospitalize against their will, the majority of them are going to be black. It's going to be disproportionate. That's one thing that we're going to know when shit is real, when the backlash is real. When they stop worrying about the dis something being disproportionate. Press one. Salute to Nick Tal Javon, man. He says, us sons have no shame. We will gladly take every handout handicap program available. Sons fight so hard to have lower standards. It's embarrassing. Yeah, man. But I don't think most sons are embarrassed. I think only sons like you are embarrassed. I think the typical son is embarrassed by lower standards. They don't find shame in that. Salute to Charles. He says, Ock, at Kaiser, I only see black female doctors now. I'm sure they didn't earn their way. Give me a white or Indian doctor. Yeah, man. White doctor for me, man. White therapist or Asian therapist, man. Some things some people ain't good at, man. Some things some people ain't good at, man. I could do a black physician, but a surgeon, I want my surgeon to be white. But I could do a black physician. I want my surgeon to be white, man. And my pharmacist, of course, the pharmacist is going to be Ethiopian. Every pharmacy you go to, they always Ethiopians or Nigerians. 